our next speaker is William or Gus, Gus. Simmons, uh, and he is a <coughs> uh, professional engineer from uh, Kavanaugh and Associates. So uh, again, my name is Gus Simmons. I'm uh, from North Carolina, and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, capitalizing on bioenergy potential at municipal wastewater plants. So why we've heard a lot today about animal manures. I deal with family in the world as well and cultural waste. So why are we talking about municipal wastewater treatment plants? Well, for one thing, we've, uh, we've heard a lot about economics this morning, operational challenges, whether to heat or not, whether to mix or not. What's one of the biggest reasons that anaerobic digesters are not implemented more frequently in the U.S.? What was that? Cost. Somebody said cost. Is it operating cost or is it capital cost that's usually the inhibitor? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was hoping somebody say capital cost. Well, capital costs end up being a lot of the uh, a lot of the hurdle, at least for bringing new digester projects on the ground. And I want to share with you a little bit about the great hidden infrastructure that's out there that's available for all of us to use at these municipal wastewater plants. So, uh, a little bit of background: uh, many of the uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants in the U.S., as you know, utilize anaerobic digestion as a primary treatment process. Uh, almost all of those plants are running at 40 to 50 percent capacity as we sit here today. So there's a tremendous amount of unused capacity and infrastructure that you and I are already paying for as ratepayers. Uh, and so one idea is to potentially try to optimize the use of that. Uh, there's lots of pressures to continue to increase the generation of renewable energy, clean energy. Uh, we have rising electricity costs increasing consumer demands for efficient utility operations. You guys heard that or read that in the newspapers. So ratepayers are saying, hey, why are my sewer bills going up? Meanwhile, you've got a plant over here that has a capacity and you're already planning to expand it again. Uh, so there's this great inequity in how we utilize efficiently that existing uh, infrastructure. And so the burning question gets to be, why aren't we utilizing this stuff? Why do we have all this concrete and equipment sitting out there uh, half empty that we're not utilizing. Well, here are some of the reasons, because I ask. I ask a lot of these crazy questions. So I ask a lot of municipal system operators, why are you not doing this? Uh, some of these questions I've asked to folks who are sitting next door to food processing plants, and they said, no, I don't want your organic stuff in my wastewater plant. I like my 150 BOD stuff that I'm trying to, to feed into an anaerobic digester. So these are a lot of the reasons I hear. Uh, number one is uh, we're worried that uh, we're too small to be cost effectively using our biogas. Well, we've talked about the biggest inhibitor's capital cost, and that's already sunk. It's on the ground. So I'm not sure that holds water. Uh, afraid of new technology. Uh, that's a big, big killer for these folks. Uh, concerned that we don't yet understand all the ins and outs of anaerobic digestion. I've enjoyed the presentation this morning, and I would say they've made me feel even better about the resiliency of anaerobic digestion. <laughs> Uh, and how it can uh, overcome some of the challenges we try to throw at it. Uh, afraid of giving up space at our wastewater treatment plants. Afraid the utilities don't want it. And by the utilities, I'm not talking about water wastewater. I'm talking about the electron and gas managing folks. Uh, and then just worried it's, not, uh, it's just not worth the trouble. So to give you an idea of the scale of this opportunity and the wasted uh, infrastructure capacity we've got, uh, according to the EPA, there's over 16,000 permitted municipal wastewater treatment plants in the U.S. About 10% of them utilize anaerobic digestion. I'm going to show you some data in a few minutes that's a sampling from those that will show a higher efficiency than 10%. So I want to go ahead and give you that disclaimer. I'm fixing to show you some conflicting data. But it's okay. We'll deal with it. Uh, and then according to the EPA research uh, that's been accomplished, the rule of thumb that it, that's used is roughly you can, for municipal waste, you can get about 2.4 million BTU per day per million gallons of uh, wastewater treated. So just sort of keep that rule of thumb in the back of your mind because we're going to see it here in just a moment. So let's talk about some of the compelling reasons that we should be looking at uh, harvesting the energy value from these municipal wastewater treatment plants. I'm not going to spend much time on this because I'm talking to a room full of experts already, but obviously our plans as a country and our plans as a, as a planet or to continue to increase our energy generation from renewable sources. Here in the U.S., uh, we're probably extracting more oil and natural gas than we ever have. I said probably, most of the newspapers say that we are. Uh, however, when you look at projections by the EIA and, and other uh, informed uh, entities, 
Uh, even out forecasting into the future, we still as a country are going to be importing about 30% of our uh, liquid fuels. So there's definitely a reason to continue to look for developing bioenergy potential uh, beyond just generating electrons. Uh, we keep talking about costs and how it's so expensive to do anaerobic digestion and operating costs and capital costs. However, when you have to really not just compare the cost of putting those facilities online, but you have to take a good look at what are the alternatives for using the energy source. We sort of de facto always get to generating electrons. Well, in some cases, that's the right thing to do. In a lot of cases, it's not the right thing to do uh, if you're trying to maximize economics. So if you just simply look at the energy value of biogas on a per MMBTU basis, for instance, compared to uh, diesel fuel and gasoline, now, I apologize, I just realized the colors don't show up very well for you folks in the back. Uh, but the main thing I'd ask you to take a look at is what I call this window of opportunity. And that window of opportunity is the differential between what the EPA reports as the average cost of biogas production at municipal wastewater treatment plants and say, for instance, what the energy value of a, gas, a gallon of diesel fuel is. So maybe generate electrons is the best way to get our return on that investment. So why, are we, uh, why should we de be developing these resources? Well, for one thing, uh, we do have a lot of natural gas in the United States, but we don't have natural gas everywhere. And so uh, it, this is a map, uh, again, uh, that was produced by the EIA that uh, demonstrates the shell gas plays in the lower 48. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of very gas-rich areas. There's also a lot of places that maybe not have so much gas, but we do have a lot of agriculture. So uh, for instance, my home state here in North Carolina disputed how much natural gas we have in North Carolina, uh, but the reality is we have lots and lots and lots of biomass, lots of organic stuff. And according to NREL, actually the third most prevalent organic stuff of anywhere in the whole country, why should we be focusing on extracting natural gas when we've got this huge energy potential that's right above the dirt? It's just a matter of rerouting some of this stuff to uh, existing unused capacity. Uh, this map is an example, I'm going to talk about my home state for a minute because you should always pick on where you live instead of where anybody else lives. Uh, so to give you a good example, uh, the green dots are permitted municipal wastewater treatment plants that have a capacity greater than one million, gallon, uh, one million gallons per day. The red line is uh, Transco, major natural gas pipeline. The yellow line is a second intrastate natural gas pipeline. And look at how many green dots are on that pipeline. So we've already got not, not only the capacity to digest this stuff, but a lot of that stuff is uh, located within a golf ball uh, driver distance from existing major natural gas infrastructure where we could move this stuff around and share it with our neighbors. Uh, this is a map that I created to, to, to bring it a little bit uh, uh, clearer, I guess. All the white dots are major and minor municipal wastewater treatment plants. The pink dots are uh, municipal solid waste landfills and the green pipes are major pipelines. So again, this isn't little diameter service stuff. This is six, eight inches and larger transmission scale natural gas pipelines where we could move gas to consumers. Uh, oh, by the way, the Atlantic Coast pipelines will be cutting in the eastern uh, third of the state as well. So we're having even more uh, ability and, and certainly across the country, we should continue to see more and more distribution infrastructure going in place. So. We've got all this unused anaerobic digester capacity at these municipal wastewater treatment plants, and we've got all this pipeline infrastructure to move the energy potential around. So the argument of we're too far away from consumers, we don't have the infrastructure in place, it costs too much to build these things, a lot of this stuff already exists. It's just a matter of changing our behaviors and our mindset to begin to utilize what we've got. Plus, it's an infinitely renewable resource, right? So as long as we inhabit the planet, we're going to be creating more and more and more organic stuff. Every time we sink a well, there's less and less and less of that stuff in the ground. Uh, so just from a policy standpoint, continuing to determine what are the artificial escalators of cost that we put on these systems and working on that versus uh, always trying to figure out how to make it cheaper to build them may be a good use of our time. So I, I talked about a little bit of conflicting data. So a few minutes ago, I said EPA says about 10% of the wastewater plants uh, out there have anaerobic digesters. Uh, if you zoom to the bottom of this chart, it says 43%. The reason being, this is a subset. So this is a sample of all those wastewater treatment plants, not the entire uh, data set. Uh, but if you take a look at uh, just at the percentages of wastewater plants that have these anaerobic digesters, I mean, even down in the lower uh, size range, 
even in the one to five million gallons per day. Not that big of a waste for a treatment plant. Uh, out of this sampling, still over a third of them had an anaerobic digester. And again, most of those are sitting half empty, uh, underutilized. Uh, so I, I talked a little bit about the comparative economics. Maybe we shouldn't always default to generating electrons or generating heat. Maybe looking at some of the other viable uses uh, in the transportation sector as an example. Uh, so if you start to uh, look at, uh, for instance, let's just take a uh, 10 million gallon per day uh, or, uh, or greater wastewater treatment plant. Uh, here in my own home state again, of uh, North Carolina, we've got 42 of those in our state. Uh, if you look at the energy value capacity, it could uh, represent 17,000 diesel gallon equivalents per day, or about 135,000 truck miles that could be supported. So the economics of that are vastly different than 8 cent a kilowatt hour electricity put on the grid. So, uh, and again, in certain places, that may make a lot of sense. Using that same um, uh, 10 MGD plant, and this is based on a study we did specifically for a municipality that was looking to bring in some additional agricultural wastes to up their biogas generating potential. Using that uh, magic factor of 2.4 uh, MMBTU per million gallon per day, so that 10 MGD translates into 24 MMBTU per day. Uh, just comparing the revenue streams, that could be worth about $32,000 in electricity. But again, if instead we displace diesel fuel, for instance, the diesel fuel that's consumed by the solid waste collection trucks every day, the diesel fuel that's consumed by the school buses that serve that town every day, it's worth up to about $200,000 revenue for them. Vastly different payback. And again, we're talking about facilities that were built with the idea that there's a 40 or 50 year payback, and the reality is there ain't no payback because in 40 or 50 years you've already expanded the plant again and you've taken on new debt. Uh, we're trying to compare that to upstarts, entrepreneurs who are trying to build anaerobic digesters with a three-year payback uh, here in the private sector. So bridging the gap, taking advantage of some of these economics uh, will help us see more of these facilities come on the ground. So I want to give you a couple of case studies uh, where we've taken this approach to look at utilizing uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants uh, at a, a higher capacity factor, utilizing some animal manures and agricultural waste. Uh, so the first plant that I'll talk to you about uh, has a nominal capacity of 14 MGD. Their average uh, daily flow right now is about 9 MGD, so they're sitting at about 65% utilization, which is high for most municipal wastewater plants. Uh, the biogas yield based on the EPA factor should be 21.6 MMBTU per day. Uh, take out about 25% parasitic load for keeping the digester heated. They should be producing about 16 MMBTU per day. Uh, actually, their actual plant data, they're producing more like 20. So a little bit better than the EPA factor. Uh, if we take the conventional approach, let's go generate electrons with that. Uh, at 8 cents a kilowatt hour electricity, it's worth about $22,000 a year. Do you think that gets a city manager excited? No. Wouldn't even pay for the uh, engineering study to get you here at this particular point in time. However, if we take a look at a little bit of a different approach, that same wastewater plant, and let's instead look at displacing diesel fuel instead of generating electrons, uh, based at $2.90 uh, per diesel gallon equivalent for the CNG market, uh, that could be worth up to about $131,000 per year. That's just if you're selling CNG in the open CNG market at current CNG prices. If we look at the actual value of displacing the diesel fuel that they're using for their solid waste collection trucks, uh, they use about 20 MSW collection trucks that travel about 125 miles per day, or about 2,500 truck miles per day. Uh, based on that and displacing instead of 290 uh, per diesel gallon equivalent CNG, actually displacing the cost of diesel fuel uh, it could save them about $175,000 a year. Now we've got the city manager's attention. Instead of $22,000 electricity, displacing the value of that diesel fuel. Uh, the economic analysis to short it based on time uh, is about a million dollars to build the gas cleanup and pressurization system for a fast fill to fill their solid waste collection trucks. About $10,000 in annual operating cost for that component. Remember, they've already built the digester, they're already running the digester, they're already running the flare, all that stuff's already paid for. The additive cost of the CNG system is about $10,000 a year for a return on investment of five years. In the municipal infrastructure world, that's pretty doggone good. Uh, second case example, uh, this is probably more typical, smaller, I pick smaller wastewater treatment plants on purpose. 
Uh, it's about a 9 MGD nominal capacity, and uh, they're running about 3, so about 30% of their capacity. Uh, same kind of math, they should be producing about 7.2 MMBTU, 25% taken away to heat the digesters. Should be producing a net of 5.4, they're actually netting about 5.6. So pretty close to what the, uh, the, the rule of thumb factor should be. Same uh, economic analysis, if I look at generating electrons at eight cent a kilowatt hour displaced cost, it's worth about $8,000 a year. You just got a yawn from the city manager. Nothing there that excites them at all. However, again, similarly looking at, uh, at producing CNG or displacing uh, diesel fuel, uh, same kind of analysis in, uh, in the essence of time, I'm not gonna read it here for you. Uh, but based on displacing diesel fuel in a, same, a similar scenario at $3.85 uh, per gallon, for them it's worth about $63,000 in fuel savings a year. That caught the city manager's attention. He could definitely see a payback there. In this case, that was enough uh, energy value to not only supply the MSW fleet for the solid waste collection and trucks, but also they're evaluating expanding more of their fleet, even in police cruisers, uh, converting the cruisers to uh, CNG and displacing gasoline. So I just wanted to, uh, since we're close to lunch, I was going to give you a couple of eye candy shots of some similar systems because uh, this is being done in some places. Anybody here from Louisiana? No? Uh, this is a, a picture of the St. Landry uh, Parish Solid Waste Disposal uh, District System. Uh, this is a landfill gas system. It's not a municipal wastewater treatment plant system, but very similarly, uh, they're using the methane gas they're harvesting off of that landfill gas system to power police cruisers, their public works trucks, uh, all kinds of vehicles, lawnmowers that they're using to cut the grass in the city limits. They found the value of displacing a higher cost energy product uh, with the, the bioenergy that they're harvesting. That made the economics much, much more attractive. It takes it from the 30, 40, 50 year payback period to the five year payback period, so it makes sense for them. Uh, this is an example of a, uh, a pressure swing absorbent system uh, operating in Newark, Ohio. Anybody here from Ohio? Wow, where is everybody from? Uh, this, uh, this is a municipal wastewater treatment plant system uh, deployed at a municipal wastewater treatment plant. They're actually purifying the pipeline gas quality. They're sticking it in the pipeline. So folks in the town who are using natural gas to heat their homes or cook their lunch are using biomethane from this wastewater plant. Other end of the spectrum, this was a really small system, only 75 SCFM. That's like the size of a pig farm or maybe a small dairy farm in gas flow. Uh, so it can be done on a very small scale basis. Uh, here's the other end of the spectrum, a much larger system, San Antonio, Texas. Anybody from Texas? All Midwesterners in here. I can't find anybody that's uh, from these areas. Uh, this is a 1300 SCFM uh, system, again, taking it to pipeline quality putting it in the uh, existing natural gas pipeline, folks in the state of California are loving it because they're using it to uh, meet some of their renewable energy goals. And then finally, a similar system that's in the middle, 700 SCFM, so it may be similar size as a large dairy uh, that's being done in uh, city of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, same thing, cleaning it up to uh, pipeline quality. I'm currently working on a swine digester project that is uh, aggregating the gas from several adjacently sited swine farms that's about that same size. Same plan, purifying the natural gas pipeline quality, putting it in the pipeline. So a couple of summary points because I just got the one minute card. Um, so just a couple of things I'd ask you to keep in mind. As you're talking with folks about these AD systems, number one, should anaerobic digestion always generate electrons? Probably not always. Uh, in some cases it may make good sense, but there's a lot of cases that that really, really, really kills the economics right off the bat, because electricity is generally cheap. Uh, take a look at the other uses for the energy. A uh, couple other questions, does, does where you live buy fuel? Yeah, we buy a lot of it, for solid waste collection trucks, buses, things like that. How much excess capacity exists in the municipal wastewater plant where you live? I don't know for sure where you live, but I'm willing to bet it's a lot. It's probably close to half of the capacity is unused. Uh, is fuel getting less expensive? Of course not. Is the population getting small, smaller? Of course not. This is a growing resource uh, that's infinitely renewable. So uh, last shot, again picking on my home state. I talked a lot about municipal and the opportunity for municipal wastewater treatment plants. Remember the map I showed you that had the white dots and pink dots where wastewater plants were in landfills? 
This is if you overlay the agricultural sources. This is when you overlay dairy farms with all the blue dots, uh, wet poultry systems with all the yellow dots, the dry poultry guy, where'd he go? He's not in here. Uh, I didn't put dry poultry systems on here, just wet poultry. And then all the green dots from swine farms. So can you imagine the opportunity if some of these agricultural sources began to utilize some of the existing capacity in these municipal wastewater plants? And they're all over top of the existing natural gas pipelines. So with that, I'm glad to take any questions. Yes? Um, we've experienced some resistance from the electrical um, utilities and people uh, connecting on and selling on. Have there been similar resistance from the natural gas pipeline people for having these new sources coming in the pipeline? A absolutely. And the great question is why? Because, uh, for instance, Transco, one of the major pipelines in the east, already has landfill gas, municipal wastewater plants, and farms that are putting gas in that pipeline. Granted, it's not a large percentage of the gas, but it's already in there. Uh, in most cases, uh, the systems that I showed you, the pressure swing absorbent systems, they produce regularly uh, pipeline quality gas that's greater than 95% methane. Most of the gas in the pipeline is 92%-ish. Uh, so they actually produce a higher quality, higher BTU gas than what's already in the pipeline. So it's a great question, and the question to go back to is why? It's a paradigm. It's just we haven't typically done it, so why should we do it? Yes? Uh, more of a comment, but just a couple hours up the highway up north, we have some great examples. I, I built, I'm told, the first anaerobic digester for agriculture to put renewable natural gas in the grid. Awesome. Uh, our gas utility, Fortis, is, is really aggressively looking for new supply. The second uh, gas pipeline and uh, agriculture digester Delta, it's 280 cows, so that answers some of the questions about being able to scale down. Uh, third one is going into construction. They did a request for expression of interest last year at 21 respondents. Now we had no government involvement in our in our project at all. I worked with our gas utility. We did a, a huge market study on what's the capacity. We came up with a dollar value because our gas utility cannot make or lose money on their gas. Right? Our utility yeah. commission really kind of screwed it up. It's regulated. The higher value. And there's a market floor, so it's you know, all sorts of weird dynamics. But uh, you know, there is great opportunities in this space. Uh, we had another factor too. We have, I say, we have a, uh, a sensitive airshed, an arguably sensitive airshed with an extremely powerful lobby group. There's a group in Abbotsford where I live that managed to shut down a, 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 a power generating station in Washington because of air pollution. So if we wanted to put even a one megawatt. Jen said, new point source emissions, it would take years and years and years of study. We can show them really easily that we're reducing the gas. So th there is support, there's a, there's a huge study done in uh, 2008 on gas pipeline from ag. You know, talking about people, one cow has the environmental impact of 30 people. So there's a lot more cows to cow in order to do something. But anyway, if I, if I can answer any questions around renewable natural gas, so we, we've done a lot, I continue to work with the gas utility, and they really really want it where our, our electricity utility has no interest at all. Yeah. One uh, quick comment, and thank you for those comments. It's great. One, uh, one other quick comment I'd share with you, and it ties back to the natural gas utility. Um, past couple of winters have been pretty cold, particularly in the northeast, uh, whereas most gas is indexed at Henry, Henry Hub in 3 to $4 to $5 range, depending where you are. Uh, on the coldest days uh, this winter and last winter, uh, people were paying 60 and $70 for gas. Most of that because those states don't generate a lot of gas in state and you'll drive by 30 farms between where you live and where the natural gas company's headquarters are. So there's, it's beginning to have a lot more momentum. Agricultural states are starting to see maybe we can produce our own gas. It just doesn't come from below the ground. It comes from above the ground. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.